thank you particularly also today to our, 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 our conversation panelists who are joining us from Japan, where it is much later than they should be working, and therefore special <laughs> thanks to that. And I'll, I'll introduce you to each of our speakers. So we have uh, Professor Kumiko Hilberdink Sakamoto from Nihon University, and she specializes in feminist Shakespeare, but also in Shakespeare reception and intercultural performance in Japan. We have Professor Ryu Taminami from Tokyo Keiza University, who is an expert in Shakespeare performance in Japan, but also in Japanese popular culture. And we have uh, Michiko Seomatsu from Gunma University, who is also an expert in Japanese Shakespeare performance and intercultural theater. And she has written a lot about the use of indigenous performance cultures in Japanese Shakespeare performances. And we have Professor Yukari Yoshihara, from the University of Tsukuba, who is the heart of the party in Japanese Shakespeare. And she specializes in gender in Shakespeare and in Shakespeare in Japanese popular culture. So let's uh, get our conversation started. I think our main topic of conversation that I've been thinking of for today is what Shakespeare, what's the status of Shakespeare in Japan today? because we have a lot of things written about the history of Shakespeare reception and about translation and about performances specifically. But I wanted to start with a quite general sense of what do Japanese people do you think, ge general Japanese people think of Shakespeare? How well known is he in Japan in reality? Because we're all Shakespeare scholars, we sort of know about Shakespeare, but how is it generally do you think? <laughs> Surprisingly well known, I think. Yep, the uh, um, Shakespeare's uh, while also, in, I mean, as us in uh, Britain, it's a big name, so uh, it's kind of an uh, audience drawer. And that's probably the reason that uh, uh, lots of big companies like to uh, put Shakespeare's plays, uh, I think. It's probably a little bit strange, but that's what's. <laughs> What is it is like in Japan? Mm. Yes, it is still the most popular Western playwright. Maybe um, Chekhov, the second most popular, but still it's a mainstream um, English playwright. But it's difficult to say general, uh, I mean, general audience because it's so diversified these days. It used to be that there are core audience for Shakespeare but it's now so, well, I mean, diversified. Um, older generation Shakespeare and younger generation Shakespeare is very different. And, but still, it's the main, I think, Western playwright. Mm. What do you think? Mm. Mm. Well, if I say, um, the Shakespeare is known to almost anyone um, because um, very, the number of people who go, go to theater is limited. But Shakespeare appears on TV commercials and mobile games and comics and um, light novel, what we call light novels and novels for young people. So they're, they're, they've never read Shakespeare's plays. So sometimes they refer to Shakespeare's plays as Shakespeare's novels. Um, but they, they are familiar with some, well, a couple of Shakespeare's plays like an Romeo and Juliet and then Hamlet, and possibly Macbeth as well. They, they are quite well known among the people, young people and then older generations as well, I think. Yeah. Well, definitely great has quite a presence. Oh, sorry. Well, great point about Shakespeare is that he can make us believe that we know his works even without actually reading the works. A lot of youngsters are knowing Romeo and Juliet, mostly through comics, animation, and perhaps some of the, 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 the TV shows performed by popular stars. And they would, not, they would not even try to approach original Shakespeare, even though it is in Japanese translation. And while this sort of phenomenon is quite interesting, in order to get to know, in order to get to know what is that, what is the Shakespeare's social political status for the for, to the to the 
to these youngsters who are addicted to these gadgety sort of popular culture. But well, this is my take. But but at the same time, some all some more sophisticated people who tend to be slightly older, they would know, they would intimately know Shakespeare, particularly something like Romeo and Juliet, King Lear, etc. particularly because these older generation get to, get, to, get to learn to adore Shakespeare by watching BBC Shakespeare series released on NHK here. That's what I think about. So there's a contradiction. Some, some sectors are admiring him, Shakespeare himself, but other sectors are sort of using Shakespeare mm. to, 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 as an excuse to enjoy uh, popularized Shakespeare. Mm. But also, um, I'm now um, sitting in front of no stage, but also traditional theater practitioners too, uh, well, using Shakespeare, yeah? There yeah. are many, mm -hmm. many productions mm. that incorporate traditional theater practice and they're quite famous and popular. For example, Nomura Mansai and some Kyogen Shakespeare. And I think they're, um, I maybe. Some, um, hmm? Sorry, sorry, no, go on. I just seem to be cutting I'm sorry, just that I just uh, was been thinking that, um, I tried to remember exactly uh, what I read somewhere, but uh, it's something like, uh, uh, we, uh, meaning Japanese, unfortunately, lack some of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, good place, uh, sort of material for uh, staging. Uh, sorry, I, I think that's, that's what I, I read somewhere, that someone said, I think it could have been Ninagawa actually, uh, said something like the, uh, that the, we don't have enough place uh, uh, to use uh, for the modern audience as a result. You of mean the, Japanese, the, Japanese plays? Hmm? Modern, modern like Japanese? Shakespeare, uh, the, uh, it's kind of handy uh, uh, material uh, because we can do uh, something totally different from what the uh, British directors are doing as well. So just uh, something like that. But sorry, just Michiko, you, you're saying no, something. No, 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 it's sorry. okay. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Sorry, please. Because, yeah, Shakespeare can be really adaptable, yeah? That's yeah, why yeah. Ninagawa yeah. like, yeah. likes doing Shakespeare. And you can and, do it again. And and Shakespeare is copyright free. We can do anything. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, that's a very good point. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> no right but, issue. Uh, yeah. So, well, I I can go back to go back a bit to go back about 100 years, 150 years ago to say that the first Japanese Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice was non kabuki adaptation. The story is was following Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, but the characters were turned into Japanese in kimono. And in other instance, in the first in the first uh, Japanese adaptations of Shakespeare's Othello, the story was set in Taiwan under Japanese colonization. So these are the instances how Shakespeare was adaptable in the, in the context of Japanese history, politics, et cetera. And ever since Shakespeare's works are uh, giving us a really great occasions to, to adapt use, utilize, circulate, uh, reuse Shakespeare to produce something new and weird and awesome. And uh, the most recent product of this sort of uh, history, culture of adaptation is now appearing in popular culture, in manga, anime, cosplay, but they are sort of inheriting the tradition or history of adaptation adapting Shakespeare, who is copyright free. Mm -mm -mm. 
But also in between those two well, um, eras of adaptation, I think there is a reaction against the adaptation. So we try to be authentic as the British Shakespeare and some <laughs> actors in 1950s wearing golden wigs and padded nose and try to look British or well, European <laughs> to stage they Shakespeare. They should have and, looked ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but there is a there's a certain period of um yeah, trying to be well authentic like um British Shakespeare's yeah it's more than one hundred years ago yeah Shingeki Shakespeare for example yeah but it's not limited uh, to the one hundred years ago because in in nineteen fifties and people some leading directors went to the UK just like in a Fukuda scenario yeah. and. He actually tried to replicate yeah, yeah. Hamlet. He saw in London, uh, actually, Old Vic was somewhere. So that's what he did. That, that, that's the model of Shakespeare performance at that time. So in the 1950s and 60s, replication was the idea of performing Shakespeare in Japan, I think. Of course, the language is different, but the behave movements and yeah. temples they try to copy that yeah, so there's yeah. some discrepancies <laughs> between the movement and the language rhythms but they try to uh, replicate and that's what they admired so we have to think about the what is Shakespeare Shakespeare is not quite the doesn't have a clear uh, line or about what is Shakespeare but then hmm. around that time or, or any time in Japan the contemporary British Shakespeare was the model and the authority of the performance up until 1970, mm, I think. 80s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Possibly 80s, mm -hmm. and, but then, yeah, Shakespeare theatre was slightly different from what they did. You know, we, we Japanese are supposed to be really good at copying, imitating. <laughs> <laughs> Fukudatsunari <laughs> is showing he show well could be showing he was true Japanese by by faithfully imitating and copying uh British Shakespeare. But and I was wanting to add well, something more. Well, Fukudatsunari was on the Rockefeller Foundation when he was visiting, he was visiting America and the UK. And the Rockefeller Foundation was trying to make uh, someone like Fukudatsuneari pro-American, pro-UK uh, uh, intellectual by sending him to, to the States and to, to the UK. So Fukudatsuneari's faithful, faithful imitation or copying of Shakespeare could be, could be one small part of, part of Rockefeller's Ferra's grander design to 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 to, to, to make uh, this whole world pro-capitalist world. And let me also add that at that time, Rockefeller Foundation was quite active to to build some sort of Americanized Shakespeare theme park in places in North North America named Stratford upon Navon. Mm. So this, uh, it, this is another aspect of uh, 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 Shakespeare culture, which is combined with touristy theme park experience. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. But if it, I could add a bit, expand a bit about uh, what you guys you said, and that's also true with an Shakespearean scholars in Japan. Lots of scholars of uh, English studies uh, received grants from the United States and just went there to study, to get, to get some higher degrees or just study there for one year and then came back to teach in Japan. But that's a very important part of uh, Shakespearean in Japan as well. Sorry. So uh, that's, this is really fascinating. And I think that there's been a kind of thread running through what you've been saying that there's, there are two aspects or two levels of Shakespeare appreciation in Japan that are not entirely separable, but 
one which is a sort of higher culture, um, imitative Shakespeare, perhaps, and the other which is more a use of Shakespeare and Shakespeare in popular culture, which has existed for as long as there's been Shakespeare adaptation, Shakespeare reception in Japan. I think that it's, it's interesting, though, that even though they're inseparable, they're quite distinct, aren't they? How is it that we've ended up with the such a split in Japanese understandings of Shakespeare? On the one hand, that kind of pop culture, never read Shakespeare, but aware of his presence. And on the other, a kind of uh, trying to go against that sense of a pop culture by insisting on the Europeanness, the, the culturedness of, of Shakespeare. Are these things coming Maybe. together a bit more? <laughs> Probably the creators of those pop culture uh, artifacts, like TV commercials, animations, and, and novels, uh, very familiar with Shakespeare's plays. So they, they try to, as Yukari said, they're free resource. So they, they just used part of them to, when creating something new. So we can find lots of traces and trajectories of Shakespeare plays in pop cultural artifacts. Don't you think so, Marie? Well, I, I was just fondly remembering, remembering my first Shakespeare. My first Shakespeare was, was actually a, 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 a translation of British adaptation of King Lear in which Cordelia turned into a faithful daughter who survives being rewarded by, by her filial piety. I read it in, in my Japanese, Japanese language textbook. That, 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 that moment, I, I, I almost determined I hate Shakespeare. This story is, is so boring. But next day, I encountered a manga parody of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, in which the part of Juliet was performed by a drag queen that made me Shakespearean. So this sort of the two opposite. Uh, one, one direction is to make Shakespeare some authentic, authoritative, boring text. There's one trend and there's another trend to, to parody, to, to ridicule, to, 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 to challenge these sort of authoritative Shakespeare. These are running side by side in Japanese culture, that makes, that, that could be this coincidence that, that this side by sideness could be one of the funny but interesting part of Japanese Shakespearean culture. But I, I'm not sure whether this is really particularly Japanese characteristics. Yeah, In any country, these, there are two, well, opposite directions. Okay. Okay. Yeah, for example, in Britain, Britain English, England too, yeah, radical Shakespeare and those yeah. well, more authentic <laughs> Shakespeare. So I'm not sure it's really particularly Japanese. I take your point. But, yeah, but, yeah. But the thing is, it's, you know, Japan is not an English speaking country. You can find lots of similar things in the United States as well. Um, but if not, well, outside the English speaking countries, Mm. How many countries have you know, Shakespeare on TV commercials, Shakespeare on comics for young children? It's a um, it's slightly funny uh, phenomenon, mm. I think, isn't it? I think it's uh, as the uh, Yukari said earlier, just the Japanese uh, well known for copying things. And, uh, <laughs> I read something like the black hole of culture or something like that. So it's just like to, uh, well, I mean, they use Shakespeare as a, a very handy material, uh, copyright free. And uh, then uh, uh, for some reason, I mean, also that in Japan, as pop culture is very highly developed. So just, the, uh, well, I mean, uh, those people in pop culture also wanted to use Shakespeare as a, a very handy material. I think that's what's happening, and it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the uh, uh, pop culturized <laughs> Shakespeare. So uh, 
um, but I think that's a, the the, uh, the people outside the country probably are, 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 are pretty more interested in this Japanese uh, uh, invention of uh, anime Shakespeare or manga Shakespeare thing. So uh, that's uh, so amazing, and I should be probably proud of them. <laughs> mm. uh, and that lead me to talk about there are well. Many of manga or anime adaptations of Shakespeare is just for fun, but there are some quite serious feminist adaptations of Shakespeare's works, including Harimo Sanazaki's uh, uh, Macbeth is being created to be, to be shown from the perspective of Lady Macbeth, who is quite, quite frustrated because she cannot be powerful, powerful ruler because she is a female. And so there are some serious manga and anime adaptations of Shakespeare. I'm saying this because I'm, I'm wanting to ask, ask Kumiko to talk about, to talk, to ask Kumiko whether, are there any feminist Shakespeare production in Japan? <laughs> uh, I think just the uh, well, I, I'm uh, I'm into the uh, cross gender casting in Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, so the uh, and then I have a very uh, comparative perspective. Um, Jessica introduced me as a um, some kind of specialist in Japanese Shakespeare. A reception, but it, actually, I'm uh, quite interested in uh, British Shakespeare theatre. So uh, I think I have I can offer a little bit comparative perspective to the discussion. Um, I, I think that um, Japanese, uh, well, the, uh, the 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 productions uh, compared with the uh, British productions. I mean, cross the casting as well, but it's a pity. Uh, apolitical uh it's uh, um, they're not politically motivated so uh even there are uh, having lots of uh, uh attempts at uh, cross gender casting like there was the uh, uh, all female Julius Caesar last autumn um but uh, there is nothing feminism about that because it's not mm -hmm. nothing really uh political there uh i mean as it, it, it might be some effect but i uh the uh, director of that particular production, all female uh, Julius Caesar, um, the uh, um, a, uh, uh, when he was asked at the interview, that he he said something like uh, that he just wanted to uh, play with the idea of this uh, uh, all female cast to uh, to uh, rather emphasize on the uh, this fiction or uh, the uh, the uh, this uh, illusion of theater and he, it's a bit like alienation effect that he didn't want uh, to create a, some kind of uh, illusion of uh, uh, naturalistic kind of Shakespeare production but he wanted to break that naturalistic kind of uh, I mean uh, the, uh, the the way of uh, uh, performing so he just uh, used the uh, uh, cross gender casting to do that so uh, and uh, I also uh, did some questionnaires. Uh, well, I asked some questions to the, the cast, uh, particularly the women playing the um, Caesar and uh, Brutus and May Rose Cassius, and uh, they don't seem to be that aware of. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, they they they're not really again. It's motivated. Uh, they're not motivated uh, politically. So uh, they. That's quite so typically yeah. Japanese. <laughs> they are political in being apolitical, and they 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 do the just for art for art's sake, and they would not even when they are aware of the political implication, they are not too happy about talking about political social aspects of the, of the of the production. That's so typical Japanese theater uh, producer that are. Felt, but I was thinking about another another theater, Kakikukyaku, who are doing 
all female production, they are consciously they are consciously criticizing these all male productions because all male productions can deprive talented uh female actors to have the chances to show their, their their art on stage and i'm i know ryuta has a lot to talk about kakiku kek all female all female production mm -hmm. yes and then kakiku kek's production is a uh, they say nyotai female body shakespeare's and the, they try to explore the possibilities on stage presence of female actors. So that's, um, well, that, that will be, can be associated with an, well, feminism and the gender issues as well. But also they are trying to explore the possibilities of female actors on stage. And yes. so they are actually um, beautifully combined on stage and they don't have to, they don't try to be feminine at all. So there are more, more, what do you call neutral, or they just changes from uh, masculine and uh, feminine, and the one actress moves moves from one um, mm -hmm. aspect to another quickly. So the we, we we well, it's up to the audience, of course, but you feel the fixed idea of gender of each character is just getting ambiguous and. Um, mm -hmm. A way of looking at Shakespeare's play will change, I think, doesn't it? <laughs> I think there is a long tradition of uh, uh, cross gender casting in Japan. I mean, particularly uh, uh, the, the men playing women, but also uh, to a certain extent, women playing men as well in Takarazuka. So as a result, I think that the Japanese audience tend to expect uh, uh, the uh, representation of uh, genders rather than the uh, uh, representation of characters. Uh, I heard this from a uh, uh, salmon who's a, a very, uh, well, we talk to that probably the general audience today, so I'm just mentioning this uh, sort of general audience. Uh, she's, uh, she's a, a very keen theatre uh, goer, but uh, she's not uh, uh, Shakespearean. And uh, she saw this uh, production, the uh, all-female production of uh, Julius Caesar, and uh, she said she was a little bit disappointed because uh, she said she couldn't see the point uh, 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 of uh, having uh, uh, women playing uh, men because they are not really uh, showing uh, sort of uh, masculinity uh, or some sort of, uh, it's like a sign uh, or signifiers that uh, they are just uh, the, uh, as uh, uh, Ruta said, it's kind of neutral kind of acting. And then uh, so she, uh, she expected as a very serious theatre girl, expected something like Kabuki, uh, the representation of uh, uh, very clear gender distinctions. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, just so Yeah, there's probably the fluidity, fluidity of um, gender, yeah, gender fluidity. will be um, the focus of the play. And, um, you know, what you expect from performance <laughs> affects the understanding or appreciation of the performance. So, uh, well, that's one way of looking at play, so that, that's fine. But at the same time, there, there are many ways of uh, looking at play, the same performance as well. So. Sometimes a director intends something, but spectators have completely different in their minds. So um, even some conventional or traditional uh, performance could be very uh, feminist or some quite political uh, performance can become. Yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, I think. sorry, I said politically motivated, but as a result, I don't know about the effects. Uh, mm. So probably I, I, uh, I was not, uh, making that clear. So mm -hmm. uh, I use the word politically motivated because I, I just finished this symposium about mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the casting and then uh, I talked about uh, the, the, the British movement, uh, like tonic theater and, and things. So just uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, I'm, I'm a little oh, bit obsessed. I, I was disappointed about that Julius Caesar, uh, <laughs> yeah. the way they pub publicized the production before. It was, they, they just said, um, so and so uh, famous feminist uh, female actor will play. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just, yeah. 
so popularized, yeah, in in the uh, public publicity. But that, that, that's what that's actually connected to what uh, Kumiko said before. There, there, someone said there's no place for performing Shakespeare. That that's mm -hmm. quite uh, linked to what's happening there because in uh, commercialism or commercialization of Shakespeare is a uh, uh, characteristic of Shakespeare in Japan on stage or on page or wherever on on on, on the internet as well. Popular so, culture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. The, so during the interlude, it will work. Yeah, Sorry. I I heard some audiences are talking about the what's happening in front of us, and they expected it. it's not. I, I didn't expect like this performance. Yeah, because they expected. Um, more maybe Takarazuka like um, yeah 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 exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. rosy yeah, exactly. pictures and, yeah, yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. the, the uh, those the uh, actors uh, the, uh, the, the well I mean uh, they uh, intentionally try to be uh, neutral yep mm -hmm. gender neutral and then a the costume is very uh, gender yeah neutral. yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking about the Takarazuka adaptation of Julius Caesar. Which mm. came about twenty years ago. Yeah. Well, oh, twenty years ago, oh. almost twenty years ago, and well, it was a Takarazuka sort of Takarazuka. <laughs> she was just so yeah. gorgeous. And that was interesting. Yeah, but but politically saying, it was quite right winged one because it was it was it was using Julius Caesar to try to persuade us that Japan should de should militarize once again. Japan should become a more militarily powerful nation. That stage was superb. Julius Caesar, female actress, was just a goddess, but the political implication made me rather sad, especially mm. when when I was remembering performing Shakespeare in Japan since uh, 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 she's for this 150 years ago, performing Julia Shiza in Japan has been connected to the movement of, well, democrat democratization movement in Japan as well. And in that tradition, Julia Shiza was the dictator who, 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 who tried to stop democratization movement among the people. So, well, of course, there's another kind of tradition, uh, uh, another kind of interpretation in on that in that second trend of uh, uh, understanding of Julius Caesar in Japan. Well, Julius Caesar could be could be could be made into an imperial hero. And this, this sort of uh, trend is some easy was being connected with Jap Japan's imperial expansion back in 1930s and 1940s. So in my eyes, uh, Takarazuka performance of Julius Caesar about 20 years ago was a sort of revival of this militaristic interpretation of Julia Caesar, even though the actress was just a goddess. <laughs> That's very interesting. I was going to ask actually whether you thought there were there were great differences in the way that Shakespeare is performed now in Japan versus when he was being trans was being performed in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And to some extent, you've already addressed this question. That there was a lot more imitation going on before but but what you kind of just said puts me in mind that there are also revivals that there are some things that stay quite similar so yeah I, i'd like to hear more about that Michiko, maybe yeah it, it's different i think yeah be, be, at last we are free from those shingeki shakespeare i think for me well hmm. One of the reasons is because of the COVID, uh, they cannot stage big Shakespeare these days. Mm -hmm. And so the number of cast is small. And um, I think particularly younger directors are well, adapting in 
um, maybe extreme way, for example, on, well, act by six or seven actors. I, I was really um, impressed with the, uh, I forgot the name of the director, Macbeth by, um, um, Dunlop something. <laughs> anyway. okay. Do, do you know Kumiko? Um, you don't know. Mm, well, anyway. Anyway. Well, anyway, at Yokohama recently. But anyway, um, kindly, uh, ki they're, they're kind of adaptation, but they're very bold and challenging uh, adaptation. And of course, it pairs down Shakespeare a great deal. I still miss Ninagawa's big Shakespeare, mm -hmm. but I think there are new young um, uh, directors are trying to do something uh, different and challenge the um, authentic notion of uh, copying Shakespeare. Mm. Mm. Speaking of Julius Caesar, I did watch the Kakushin Han production, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. seemed to me quite a radical interpretation and, and quite political, because the, the scene in the Senate, they just did a little bit of a skit, didn't they, where they copied the, the Japanese Houses of Parliament and the kinds of discussions that happened there. And it's interesting, you were saying before that in terms of feminism, there's often a, an apolitical mm. Shakespeare going on but is there definitely more of a it, are there more political productions these days or is that just a one-off hmm. I think they are more political younger ones yeah it's uh, culturally uh, people don't like to talk about politics so much and it's probably it's not they don't want, uh, so the politics doesn't come to the fore so easily. I think in Japan, it's a cultural thing, particularly compared with British people who want to uh, discuss politics in a pub. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Maybe they're not political, but I can sense that the younger generations are not happy about what's happening in Japan, the, the condition of the society. And um, so they are sort of expressing that anger and um, the sense of uncertainties and that kind of thing in Shakespeare. So it, that can be political in a sense. Uh, they are no against what's happening right now. By, mm. Mm. And surely there was quite a lot of that in the 1960s and 70s, mm. the student mm. movements mm. as well. Yeah, it's not as radical as, for example, Ninagawa or uh, Suzuki Tadashi, but still they are trying to show that they are not satisfied with the, the uh, social conditions and... Um, Which kind of productions um, are you talking about, Michiko? The, uh, hmm? uh, what, what productions are you talking about or what companies are you talking ah, about? Ah, sorry, yeah. let me see. Yeah, just name. I wonder, because I... Kakushinha? Not Kakushinha. Shake Spear, something? No, no. Uh, Daru Colored Pop. Oh, Daru Colored Pop. Macbeth, mm. 2019. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, that was really interesting. Uh, mm. Yeah. Tani Kenichi by Tani Kenichi. Mm. Google. Daru Colored Pop. <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, and actually related to that point, I wonder, because, you know, you were saying how there are many productions in the in the middle of the 20th century that tried to copy English productions. Oh. So in some ways, Shakespeare that brings in Japanese traditional performance is not especially traditional Japanese ways of performing Shakespeare, right, that that people like Ninagawa, I suppose, or the Utopia productions or or the various no style or kabuki style Shakespeare's that have happened recently, aside from those very, very early, late 19th century Shakespeare's, that is that quite a modern phenomenon in Japan? It happens perhaps after 1980s, yeah. Um, I always think uh, the Globes, Tokyo Globe Theater is a um, 
offering the site, the place for experiment and the traditional theater practitioners experimented a lot there during the 12 years of Tokyo, Shakespeare, Tokyo Globe Shakespeare days. And after that, I think there are many um, Shakespeare's with traditional practitioners um, trying to mm -hmm. talk in Shakespeare or know Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, probably um, around the 1970s, there, there are lots of um, young uh, theatre companies that try to adopt uh, traditional theatre techniques, and um, but they are almost always performed in the what they call an underground theatre, theatre mm. in the basement, in small, uh, small venues, so they, they are not commercially um, Mm. successful, not well known, the, the, the number of audiences was very small. So mm. they were not um, popular in a sense that they were, they had only limited uh, audiences. They are quite elitist in a sense, and they're not happy with the Shingeki replicational style. That's um, in late 1960s, 1968, nine, um, around that time, so they tried to rediscover traditional mm. theater. That, that's the more general movement in Japan, but of course Shakespeare is linked to that movement around that time. And Ninagawa started his career in 90s, late 1960s, and then actually he was under that kind of uh, movement as well, and the Suzuki, of course, as well, mm. I think. And they were part of the polit uh, student political acti activism as well. Um, so that, during that time, art was, was deeply connected with this sort of uh, 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 anti-establishment movement, but ever since somehow that, that, that the connection between the politics and the, and the theater was under pressure for, for longer for a long time, I guess. And well, one of the problems about theater performers is they're expensive to produce. <laughs> they are expensive to, to see. In that way, for example, Tokyo Globe was mostly for mostly for fairly well to do, middle middle class. Audience. It was cheap. It was 5,000 yen. Mm. I want it. So it was mm. so cheap. I, so they were there trying to open up Shakespeare to, to less affordable people. That's oh, good yeah, to hear. Yeah. I didn't remember that. But one, another thing I remember about Tokyo Globe Theater is that they are now, they are now at that theater. It's not for Shakespeare now. Therefore, a pop Japanese Dannies. beautiful boy artist, <laughs> and this well, this can be a sign. This can be one of the signs how Japanese society is changing from something authentic uh, uh, offered at a reasonable rate to something more consumable, something so fashionable, but something that could come and go. Well. I'm, I'm, I'm telling me that I have to revisit Tokyo Globe today so that they, so that we can, I can see what sort of a change is coming to. You cannot get the ticket. You cannot get a, get a ticket. They're all they're sold out sold so out. quickly. Yeah. That's a that's an amazing analogy, actually, Yukari, That <laughs> the kind of pop culturization of of Shakespeare and the way that the Tokyo yeah, Shakespeare like, well, Globe gets taken over by these pop stars. Actually, actually we, we had even Shakespeare theme park somewhere in the, uh, in Chiba Prefecture, but it right. is not discounted. And we had we have a Shakespeare uh, a hotel in Hakuba. They are not being closed because COVID-19, but I can chat on this sort of stuff. But what I was trying to say, I was trying to, when I mentioned theater could be expensive, is that uh, comics, animations, the uh, TV, those, this sort of stuff can be uh, cheaper, much cheaper and much affordable. 
stuck beyond the reach and they are attracting younger people who are not so rich, who are not having experience of theater going and some of the manga adaptations and anime adaptations are doing quite openly political reinterpretation of Shakespeare, which they cannot do on stage. On stage, they cannot do this sort of experiment, I think, because it is too dangerous. Well, well if it is manga, they can, do me, they can be more adventurous because, for example, this one, Barawono Soretsu, which is an adaptation oh. of adaptation of uh, 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 Richard II. And they turned Richard into an intersex person so that the story of Richard II can have some sort of uh, uh, strong, strong sense, strong challenge against Japan's patriarchal system where, where we were female are supposed to be silent and obedient. But anyway, this is one of the cases where, when the artists are utilizing Shakespeare to challenge Japanese gendered society. Yeah, and this, this is, this it started as a manga and it turned into anime and now English dubbed version is available through other world, look at it, and be amazed to, to, to see what sort of experimental political recreation is being done in this sort of pop adaptation. Mm. Yeah, and I'm go we are going to see that production soon. Yeah, Kumiko, right? Yeah? yeah, yeah. We are going to. Yeah. Third, yeah. third, not a second. Richard third. third, I think. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Mm. so it will be staged in Tokyo. So they're staging an, uh, mm. a manga Richard, adaptation. Richard III, not taken. It, it was like the name of the Rose King or something. Rose King, the Richard III, which I found it really Richard III. Oh, Thank you for correcting me. Minami Boso. Oh, somebody is feeding in somebody, the Somebody, yeah, is making it with oh. lots of comments. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we have heavy. some questions, so maybe we can we can move on because uh, uh, thank you very much for that advertisement, Yukari. I think that that's a really good one, actually, for, for people who are interested in what the more radical interpretations of Shakespeare in pop culture in Japan are doing, because there are plenty of really kitsch ones as well. But this one is, <laughs> is probably one of the more interesting recent um, adaptations. And you're right that it does overcome those problems of, of financial uh, bars that that many young people experience in trying to get into theater and um, high culture as it were. Uh, we have a question from Sandra and Lindsay about Nianagawa's 2006 production of Titus Andronicus which went to the RSC. Um, can everyone see it? I, think <coughs> I, I should read it out for the people who are watching the recording. Um, so so they say that it was a definitely big Shakespeare. It wasn't remotely feminist or gender blind, and it referenced previous English productions, particularly the book Olivier Vivian Lee, 1955, with the streaming of red ribbons from Lavinia's amputated hands to represent blood. How far do you think that this was aimed at a Western audience? How was it received in Japan? And how might this disturbing play be tackled by current Japanese directors? Ninagawa's was very popular, was greeted with standing ovations at the RSC. Mm. <laughs> and Jennifer Lazarek actually adds that and um, uh, that that she saw that the streaming red ribbons in Japanese versions of Madame Butterfly first, and whether that actually comes from a kabuki theater tradition, whether it was actually Brooke that was copying Japanese traditions and then and um, yeah, Nagawa using it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that would be the case. I think Titus Andronicus. Uh, I don't think it was really aimed uh, at the uh, the Western audience. Uh, oh no, no, I heard, it, I heard that it was still. It was for from from the plan planning stage. It was aimed for. Oh, okay. Ah, yes, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. Inaga knew that it would be going to complete work. Yeah. That's right. As a RSC or to be a part of an Do you think that would have affected the way that he planned? Yeah, 
And I noticed about the red ribbons, I noticed that in when in Japan, the ribbon was not so many, but when I saw the picture in the UK, RSC, okay. there are so many ribbons. <laughs> I was <laughs> surprised to see that oh, how wow. they changed, yeah, yeah, to emphasize the, the I think. Um, and was it very popular in Japan, do you know? Yeah, it was. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So it was it was definitely targeting a Western audience, but it was popular to, to mm, Japanese mm, audience mm, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jennifer is asking, uh, is saying that she's very curious about the manga Shakespeare. She can't read Japanese. And so the, the question is, are the manga texts in some kind of original script format or old language or converted into modern speech? I suppose a, another corollary is, is that, is it the translations that we have of Shakespeare, or is it just modernized? Okay, well, we we do not need to try to be faithful to Jap Shakespeare's original. We can take a really large liberty with Shakespearean language. So obviously, we use we use Japanese translation, but that the artists usually take much liberty to change the, even the Japanese translation so that, it, that the Shakespearean language can be, more, can be more suited to what they're creating in their manga world. And so sometimes it is, it is really difficult to find Shakespeare in Japanese adaptation, manga adaptations of Shakespeare. And in my eyes, that part of, uh, that part of the charm of manga Shakespeare in Japan, but well, this is, I'm showing this, perhaps you might have encountered these manga, uh, manga Shakespeare series by, 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 by self-made hero, British publisher. This company is the one that globalized manga form of Shakespeare. These manga Shakespeare series are, series are now being, being sold even at Royal Shakespeare Company, or oh, the yeah. Globe yeah, yeah. as, as one of the thought about, thought about authentic original Shakespeare. Great thing about this, this series, manga Shakespeare series is that they, they did cut a bit of original Shakespeare, but they retained large number of ori original Shakespearean language. In that way, they were trying to combine entertainment via manga with education to teach youngsters to try to read Shakespeare's original language. And they did a great work, great work. Lastly, lastly. But it's not Japanese, is it? It's uh, entirely British, British, production. British production. Artists are coming from everywhere. They were resident in, in Britain and uh, they, were, they were cultivating these young artists living in Britain. So that, uh, so that sort of Britain can occupy and use, reuse manga to, to, to cultivate these younger talents living in Britain. Mm. And lastly, lastly, I have a, I have a really a serious ambition to try to translate Japanese manga adaptation of Shakespeare into English so that, so that you will be able to see amazing, amazing manga, Japanese manga adaptations in, in English. So do cheer me. I will try to do it if you cheer me. <laughs> yes, I say go for it. Definitely. <laughs> I think this that will be a really exciting thing. Jennifer is, is all <laughs> for that as well. I'm sure that there'll be many people who'd be very interested in the kinds of things that, that don't come out of Japan, in fact, because they tend to be quite minor in, in Japanese um, in manga, actually. You know, maybe the one that you showed us is the one that has sort of made a breakthrough, but most... Japanese manga based on Shakespeare is probably not going to be in the mainstream of even manga um, consumers. Well, perhaps yeah, probably the one exception is the uh, the Requiem, the Roses. That's that the one. Oh, Rose King. Yeah. Mm. Requiem Rose King. of the Rose King. Mm. Rose King. Yeah, so that's the English <laughs> version of the Rose King. Yeah. Yeah. 
But there are many more, aren't mm. there, Hikari? Yeah. Yeah, and there are Hikari. many, many, many more. For example, the manga god Tezuka Osamu recreated uh, Romeo and Juliet into the sad love story between two robots. And the, he retitled it as Robio and Robiet. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, sounds uh, cute. <laughs> yeah, they are so cute. And they, that, that, that particular manga was also reflecting Japan, Japanese society when, when it was undergoing rapid motorization and industrialization. And because Tezuka Osamu being a manga god, manga god fans would, be, would appreciate if I can translate this Robbie and Robiet into English. I would try to do it. Tezuka production will be will be happy about it. They are happy to internationalize Tezuka product Tezuka products. Sounds great. I, I think we're all <laughs> eagerly awaiting the Yoshihara <laughs> series of of manga Shakespeare. <laughs> um, we we have a very long question. I, I'm not sure we have time for. Let's see. Um, so is this a question? P. You can. Set it, thanks us for the talk and um, he, ha he has some thoughts about the special features of of Japanese productions of Shakespeare as a Chinese studying Shakespeare in Japan he has mm. the feeling that the young generation in Japan have more chances to get in touch with Shakespeare because of Japanese adaptations integrated with Japanese popular culture especially shoujo culture including shoujo manga and takarazukai in China, another country in which English is not the official language, it seems that they prefer to adapt in a more authentic way. Many Chinese traditional dramas, such as Peking Opera, adapt many Shakespeare plays, but they still have a kind of feeling that both traditional Chinese dramas and Shakespeare are, are old and noble arts. They have experimental theatre that try to integrate Shakespeare with modern culture, but still they're watched only by a small group of people. So maybe that is something that's quite interesting about Japan, as, as Yuta was saying earlier, right, that there is this popular culture strand that may not encourage people to read Shakespeare, but at least makes people very aware of Shakespeare <laughs> when they come to it. Mm. Mm. Yes, exactly. And also, uh, the, if I follow Yukari, there's another, Yukari raised another issue about the uh, internationalization of Japanese Shakespeare. And then we, we would probably think about the definition of or meanings of Japanese, the adjective of mm -hmm. that attached to Shakespeare, because in some Shakespearean productions, I mean, not stage productions, but in commercial productions, uh, internationally available on the internet, and particularly some mobile or video games freely available on the net, mm -hmm. they refer to Shakespeare. And um, well, the most famous one will be Final Fantasy, 15, some of Hamlet. you have ever heard of that. Yes, exactly, Hamlet. So mm -hmm. th that is, well, originally uh, planned by Japanese company, but they are, it is not quite Japanese. They are mm -hmm. quite popular all globally. And that's a typical ex uh, example, but there are more. There are more um, such pop culture, uh, Shakespeare, that that origin is not, um, not clear anymore. Mm. So some some game sites are available in English, in Spanish, and in Japanese. It started in Japan probably, but there's yeah. no uh, borders. Mm. So so yeah. when we say Japanese Shakespeare, that, that's quite limited sense, and uh, it's getting more global actually. So we'll have to think about those phenomena as well. Um, I think. That's a, that's a beautiful way to wrap up our talk, actually. Rika. Thank you very much, because <laughs> we can say that we start with Shakespeare in Japan, and in many ways, the, the pop culturalization of Shakespeare and the Japanese integration of Shakespeare into culture has then gone global. And so I can, I can literally say that we have Shakespeare beyond borders starting somehow in Japan in some ways. So thank you again very much for, for joining me today and for carrying on the conversation so enjoyably. I hope everybody who, who joined us today have enjoyed the conversation as much as I have sitting here in my position of privilege to ask you all questions. And yes, thank you once again to, to each of you, Kumiko, Michiko, Yukari, Ryuta for, for joining us today.
Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.